Hi, you've clicked onto the Tropical Tibbet for late Wednesday evening, August 28th. As always, the thoughts here are just mine, and in making decisions, you should consult the National Hurricane Center and the National Weather Service for the best information pertinent to your location. We're watching what is now Hurricane Dorian uh, moving north of the Caribbean. This is Puerto Rico right here. The system has moved a little farther east than expected. The track uh, continued to shift overnight and this morning, and the system moved east of Puerto Rico through the U.S. and British Virgin islands and became a hurricane during its passage through this region and is now exiting the Caribbean heading north northwestward and we can see an eye forming on infrared satellite imagery and convective bursts are firing asymmetrically around the center but getting gradually more symmetric with time and we can really see this on the San Juan Doppler radar courtesy of Mark Nissenbaum at FSU and we can see the well-defined eye showing up here with banding spiraling in and almost fully closing off an eye wall not quite yet on the southern side but it is getting there this system is very much more organized than yesterday and we are seeing fairly quick strengthening as of this recording we have recon planes investigating the storm. Lowest pressures so far have been 992, 991 millibars, perhaps as low as 990 depending on which plane is sampling. And we have very strong winds on the especially eastern side. The western side is still a little weak, but we have winds perhaps over 80 or 85 miles per hour in some parts of the circulation. So the storm is intensifying perhaps a little bit quicker than models expected at this point and the question is well what changed and we've talked about how shear has been low for Dorian during the last couple of days as it came up from the Caribbean uh, but the big limiting factor has been dry air which you can see in darker gray down here in the Caribbean and the storm has been ingesting that throughout most of its life to date but things are beginning to change we'll see that there's a lighter gray tone south of Puerto Rico here the storm is moving out of the large source of dry air in the deep tropical Atlantic and the Caribbean and up into this lighter gray region where there's more background moisture. We can confirm this by looking at some of the drop sound observations on the southern side of the storm because this is where most of the dry air has been getting entrained since last night. If we look at the drop sound mission that was done just a few hours ago, we have a couple sounds south of Puerto Rico. I'll choose one of the most representative ones here, Sand number 22, and we'll see that th there is a dry layer here, but it's much shallower, and in general the column is moister uh, by a long shot than it has been around Dorian thus far. So this is indicating that this dry side of the storm is less dry than it was, and so while the storm is still in the process of mixing out some of the dry air that's wrapping in around the southern and eastern sides, uh, it is now able to do so more effectively than it has before. And so now we're seeing this bona fide uh, strong intensification into a hurricane and uh, continuing to get stronger tonight. Now the question is, will this continue and will this uh, intensification trend abate at all? Well, the next obstacle that could be in Dorian's path is a little bit of additional wind shear imparted by this upper low to its northwest. This counterclockwise flow around the low may generate some southwesterly flow over Dorian, and with the storm moving in a slightly different direction than that upper level flow, uh, we'll have a little bit of shear. And we can see some of this on the GFS vortex average sounding for tomorrow morning showing that uh, there's a little bit of change in the wind with height southeast wind uh, down below and more southerly wind aloft and so that's uh, a little bit of shear there about 12 knots at a maximum on this particular sounding and you can see that in this thumbnail most of the moisture field is pushed off on the north and eastern sides indicating just a little bit of shear out of the southwesterly direction Will this materialize and impact the storm significantly? We'll have to see. Note that the GFS has the storm much weaker than it will be on this model. 997 millibars is too weak. If the storm is stronger, it will be a little bit more robust uh, and resist some of the shear perhaps a little bit more. So it kind of remains to be seen if Dorian will continue this pace of strengthening tomorrow, uh, but the shear, if it does occur, is expected to be 15 knots or weaker, which could allow the storm uh, to continue intensifying despite that shear, uh, but that would be the one limiting factor during the next couple of days. Once we get beyond a couple of days, uh, we start to think about some different things. This upper low is going to start backing away toward the southwest while the storm begins pivoting around that low and back toward the west, after going north northwestward for the next day, day and a half. And once that happens, we're going to have uh, a situation where 
the upper low is now near South Florida. The storm is moving into an area where the upper level flow is out of the east, and this is going to be more aligned with the storm direction, and there's likely to be less shear, assuming that this upper low generates some extra shear during the next couple of days. That shear will abate once the storm gets to this point, which is Saturday morning on this model and thus conditions are likely to be near optimal at this point. There is one thing left to watch and that's this high to the north and northwest of the storm. You can see its flow is like this clockwise uh, around this little ridge and so there's a little bit of northeasterly flow impinging upon the vortex just a little bit and especially over here this this particular little jet is far away from the storm on this run but if this jet noses in just a little bit more and there's a little bit more northeasterly flow we could see some shear from that direction as well uh, during the storm's approach to Florida and we can see that a little bit on the GFS uh, sounding at this time showing that there's a east-southeast wind in the lower levels, east-northeast wind in the mid-levels, and this, this could be a little bit of mid-level shear that the system could potentially have to deal with. But this will depend on the subtleties of this ridge, and it remains to be seen whether this will in impact the storm at all. But it has on a couple of model runs, so it's one thing uh, to watch for that could limit Dorian. However, I think the overall message right now is that the environment will be pretty favorable in general for Dorian during this time. That's what's currently expected. Indications are that uh, the system will be able to strengthen without too much limitation during the next few days, especially in the latter part of the week and the weekend as the storm makes its final approach. This is an unfortunate situation where the storm's landfall may occur during the most favorable time for intensification that the storm will have during its life. And so this storm is expected to be intense and could be extremely intense by the time it nears the mainland United States. If we look at the steering for a second here, we have the European model out to Sunday morning, day four. And talking about the track here, we talked about that upper low uh, helping to pivot the storm back toward the west. But what happens after that uh, depends on the evolution of this ridge to its north. Here's that mid-level ridge. We just mentioned it with regard to the shear, but here it is at 500 millibars, and you can see it nosing into Georgia on this European run. This is a pretty strong ridge, and so on this run of the European, the storm is moving basically due west and crosses Florida and ends up in the northeastern Gulf of Mexico, where a potential second landfall could occur in that scenario, and the landfall in Florida is fairly far south down the peninsula. On the GFS, however, this ridge is a little bit weaker. You can see its nose extends less far to the west over here near the Carolinas and the storm is farther north and it comes in closer to Daytona Beach and sort of moves inland over the southeastern U.S. instead of moving out into the Gulf as the European does farther south. And so this is one of the things that we're watching because four or five days in advance, some of the subtleties as to which model is right about just how strong this ridge is, it's hard to predict. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that often the European wins this battle with the GFS, but not always, and it's no guarantee here. One thing to note is that the polar jet is way off to the north. We have a ridge over the Atlantic and a ridge over the Rockies and a little bit of a weakness in between. This is going to become very important for when Dorian starts to near the edge of this ridge because it implies that the storm may slow down potentially a lot. And this means that if it slows down near the point of landfall or as it moves inland, this could become a major flooding threat in addition to whatever storm surge and wind damages might occur along the coastline wherever this makes landfall, uh, we could deal with a lot of flooding concerns because this is a light steering flow pattern in between these two ridges and the hurricane moving into that means a lot of water is going to fall if the storm is crawling along. So this is going to be a, a situation that needs to be monitored closely over a widespread region of the southeastern U.S. We have not yet narrowed down the precise track. One thing to keep in mind is this ridge we talked about aloft, I'll go back to the 200 millibar map, showing this northeast flow and potential mid-level shear. This could become important for the track. One thing I've noticed today is that on the European Ensemble from this morning, we have two clusters of tracks. This is from weathernerds.org, and you can see a couple of clusters of tracks. One is farther north and weaker in the blue colors here. The other is more toward the south and stronger in orange and yellow. 
this is interesting because assuming that the storm is actually stronger in here, it would tend to be influenced more by this northeasterly flow, the same flow that we see in this sounding here with northeasterly flow in the mid-levels. This is something that would push the storm farther south in theory if the storm is stronger than shown in some of the weaker ensemble runs in blue, which are unrealistically weak at this point. This makes it likely that this set of ensemble members has a more realistic depiction of the storm at this, po at this point, and the trend today has been a little bit farther toward the south. So if I had to pick one of these groups, it would be the southern one. But it's important to note that we can't pinpoint the landfall. We just can't. Uh, yesterday we had landfall expected more up here. Now it's more down here today. It may continue to shift over the next couple of days as we hone in on the detail. Hopefully the variation will lessen with time and will become more and more sure as time goes on now that the storm is north of the Caribbean. But we are really zeroing in on Florida here and uh, we're likely to have a landfall and potentially a very strong one. This is what is also expected by the official forecast from the National Hurricane Center showing a, an intensifying hurricane bending toward the left becoming a major hurricane with winds of over 110 miles per hour as it heads toward the Florida Peninsula making landfall somewhere in the central eastern coast of the Florida Peninsula on Sunday, but don't focus too much on the exact landfall point here. Again, lots of uncertainty in this part of the forecast, four to five days out, and any part of uh, Florida or the southeast coast uh, could see the storm impacting them. Keep in mind that even if the storm makes initial landfall at Florida, if it bends toward the north, we could see impacts all the way up into Georgia and the Carolinas, potentially later uh, past the weekend and into early next week. And if the storm is able to cross into the Gulf of Mexico due to a stronger ridge to the north, then we'd be talking about the Gulf Coast potentially seeing impacts as well. So really everyone in this region of the United States needs to make sure they have a hurricane plan in place just in case the storm comes your direction. We really can't guarantee who is going to get the bulk of the storm yet. It's still a few days out. We've got lots of time to watch, but preparations should begin now if you don't have uh, the proper plan and supplies in place in case the storm comes your way. Right now we can't guarantee very much except that the storm is likely to be a big deal. So take it seriously and keep an eye on the official forecast during the coming days as the situation looks to be a potentially extreme one. That's it for tonight. Thanks for watching.